I said, no, you know what? If you want to play blitz, play blitz. You know, and um, I guess. <laughs> and he just he kept learning from his blitz games, yeah. just on yes. the go, yeah, all the time. In fact, I remember, I think Gelfand once wrote an article saying, you know, Nakamura is one of a new breed of chess players. I, you know, he sort of got there not so much by studying the classics, but by, by virtue of playing hundreds and thousands of games. So basically, you guys, I'm like, I'm like a, <clears throat> I'm not the only one now, but I'm like a human version of, um, of like Alpha Zero or Leela. Basically, the way I learned was just playing Blitz over and over and over again. So it's like, it's, it is very much like the AI kind of, kind of approach. And since you guys really think it's terrible, I'll redo it. Oh my gosh. You guys can watch the video then without me. Fine, I'll, I'll redo it. Give me, give me five seconds. Oh my God, Jesus. Oh, gross. Okay, let's keep watching. Father to Hikaru Nakamura. I think the sound should be good. Uh, Sunil, Wait. it's a pleasure to what have I, you oh, here. How are you enjoying your time in India? I'm having a great time. Thank you, Sagar. It's, it's, you know, I, I also got to uh, attend the uh, cricket match. And uh, it was a pleasure going to Eden Gardens and going to such a famous cricket ground. And, and it was, you know, makes a difference when you actually know a little bit about the game and you know the players and everything. So, yeah. And of course, cricket time. in Sri Lanka is as big as uh, India. So, uh, you guys, this is November 2019. This was, um, this was during the Tata, Tata Steel Tournament. My stepfather is from Sri Lanka. So, of course, like all Sri Lankans and all Indians and all people who are from Queen Victoria's land, um, they seem to like this very, very strange, very foreign the game that you use the wooden stick with and you throw the ball. Um, so, it's not my thing, but whatever. It's all good. Of course. I mean, the only thing that would have been better is for Sri Lanka to have been playing India and for Sri Lanka to win. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> right. So, tell us about yourself, uh, your your beginnings. How did you get acquainted with chess? Was it in Sri Lanka or how was it? Yes, uh, my grandfather wanted to spend time with me. So, when I was six years old, he taught me how to play the moves. And, and uh, that's how I learned. And it was only, you know, to keep him happy. And then we played every day. We played mm -hmm. a game and, you know, he beat me every single game for about a year and a half, you know. I know, Chad. My stepfather is a fide, fide, fide master. What is Queen Victoria's land? The Commonwealth, also known as the United Kingdom and its territories. Uh, there is a good saying from the old days, approximately 200 years ago. I was there when it was, saying, when it was said. Um, there's a famous saying, when the sun never sets on, sets on the empire. Of course, um, at one point in time, the United Kingdom, more or less, um, they, they, they had territories where it was always daytime. Um, I was there, of course. But yeah, it was it was very nice because it was quality time with my grandfather. So, but back back then in Sri Lanka there was no chess culture as such. Yes, very little, very little, um, and there were just a handful of players. I mean, there were no scholastic tournaments. If I wanted to play, I had to play with regular adults, and and that's what I did. And then um, in '62, my father got a job in um, in Switzerland, in Geneva, and the family moved out there. And uh, about a year there, I did not really play any chess. And then I finally found the uh, Geneva Chess Club, and that's where I started to you know, to get better. And so your your uh, sort of you can say professional chess began in Europe. I think that would be fair. I mean, if I were to approximate my rating at the age of 13, maybe I was 1100. You know, I played a lot, uh, even since the age of seven, six or seven, but I don't think I improved much. Uh, yeah, Chad, my stepfather, um, he speaks he speaks French. Uh, he does speak French. He grew up in, in, in Geneva, in, in, uh, in, in Switzerland. And uh, so... You know, and, and then it took off when I played in Geneva. Right, and uh, how did you improve? Did you get some trainers there or you read some books? How was it? You know, in those days, there were no computers, <laughs> there were no books. I mean, the books were in German and Russian. I didn't speak either language. Mm -hmm. You know, I had learned French by then. 
but there were very few chess books in French. And this, uh, you're talking the 60s, the early 60s, the Batsford chess So the, as you see, you guys, we're talking about the 1960s. This is kind of a long time ago, a little bit different period. I think even books didn't really exist. So um, we'll keep watching. Books became popular and ac actually came to be only in the 70s. So there really wasn't anything. I had an edition of MCO 10. And that's all. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do Those of you guys who are wondering, MC MC MCO 10 is like the modern chess openings way back in the Stone Age. Um, we're talking like 60, like Jesus, that we're talking 60 freaking years ago. So it was a little bit different. They had parchment. Yes, they had parchment 60 years ago. Yes. Books invented in the 1970s. Yeah. Did you improve that? <laughs> so after I, I went to the club and it was countless hours of blitz on a Saturday afternoon. You know, everybody puts in 25 cents and you have to win two games in order to collect the money. And this is a play five, six hours on a Saturday. And um, and that's that's how I got good. Right. So what has been your highest rating uh, in chess and uh, some of your achievements uh, as a player? So I don't think I never hit 2400. I, I got to like 2365, I believe, maybe but may have been my highest. But my, my best achievement was when I scored 10 out of 14 on board one for Sri Lanka in the uh, 78 Olympiads in Buenos Aires. Wow. And That's I, fantastic. <laughs> thank you. And I just missed, I just missed the, uh, the bronze. Okay. Because by a fraction of a point, because I played all 14 games. We didn't have money to send a reserve. <laughs> And so that time you must have played some strong players as well, yeah? Yeah. I so I don't know, since I've never watched this before, I don't know if I'll be able to explain this, but when he says he finished just outside the bronze medal, um, that's because he played someone who pulled a very dirty trick in his critical last round game. He played a player from, I believe it was Australia. And uh, my stepfather likes to get into time pressure very much like, um, like uh, Alexander Grishchuk. And um, in his last round game, his opponent, the Australian player, literally wrote down a move twice to make it look like they had reached move 40. So in the last game, when my stepfather was completely winning, he lost the game on time because his opponent had intentionally written down a move twice on the score sheet to make it look like they had reached move 40, when in fact it was, it was move 39. So that game actually cost him at least a bronze medal, if not a silver or gold medal individually in the 1972 Chess Olympiad in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And now he might tell the story anyway, but I'm not sure. So that's so I thought I would mention it uh, first. I did, I did. I mean, maybe not the super strong yeah, GMs, sure. but I framed the computer printout, and because it shows Kochnai, Rodriguez, Ulf Anderson, me, uh, Spassky, Tim, wow. Van, Hubner, Kavalek, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I figured I'll never get there again. May as well frame this. You know? <laughs> so, so when did you switch from being a player to a trainer? So, you know, I, I tried to make a go as a player, but it was, you know, extremely difficult. I won the New York State Championship in '75, which was a big deal. Um, but you, uh, you did shift from Geneva oh, to U so, U.S. Or? So what I did was in, in 1970, I left Geneva uh, and I went to law school in England and I didn't complete but uh, I did three years there, and then I came to the States. So, 73, 74, I came to the States and uh, went to school, and uh, then officially immigrated in 83, when I had to go back to Sri Lanka, to the U.S. Embassy, do my interview, and, you know, and, and get it. Right. So, that's where you... So, 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 to give you guys a little... This is my stepfather. Yes, you guys, this is my stepfather. Um, so basically, I believe it was in 1972, he came to the United States with his, his parents. I believe his, his father um, had a job with the, United, with the United Nations, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so they came in, I think they came to the U.S. in 72, or maybe it was in 72 or 75. But anyway, it was around 1977 or 78, I believe it was, that my stepfather, stepfather started the program um, at Hunter Elementary School. And this is a... Hunter and Dalton tra traditionally have been the two strongest classic chess programs in the United States for more or less the last 35 to 40 years. Um, so in 1977 or 78, my stepfather started teaching there um, and he still teaches at Hunter even now. I believe he is the longest he is the longest teacher at the school at this point. There might be one other teacher who's been there longer, um, but he is one of the longest 
if not the longest uh, teacher remaining at Hunter Hunter Elementary. He's been there for, of course, 40 plus years. And Hunter is still a very strong, uh, they have a very strong chess program, both in the elementary, middle school, and high school. Um, so I just thought I would mention that. And then in, as he mentions in 83, to go back to Sri Lanka, of course, back then, um, America as a country, we were much nicer in terms of immigration and we weren't the complete jerks that we are today. So um, he was able to, he was able to get his status. Your uh, sort of training career began? Yeah, it began uh, when I realized that I couldn't make any money playing. <laughs> mm. Right. So, uh, but it, it was all, uh, it, you know, life is so much a question of luck. And, and this what happened was that very um, true life is uh, luck. this gentleman called me and said I have a son who's very talented and you've been recommended because I was this state champion so somebody recommended me and would you teach my son and I said no I, I really don't think so I'm not interested I don't teach children and, <laughs> and then he insisted and uh, I said, okay, so just to get rid of him, I said, all right, bring him around. I'll take a look. And I played with the kid and I realized, I said... Chat, this is not me, by the way, to be clear. This is, this is somebody else. This is someone else. It's not me. I said to myself, you know, he's doing better than I did at that age. So maybe there is something here. So I took him on as a student. And uh, he, then he became the youngest master in the U.S because he broke the record at the time he made master at 12 years and six months which back then you know in the late 70s was a big deal right and you won't believe who that kid is who is he carol jarecki's son ah so, in fact carol became a tournament director wow. because she got tired of hanging around a tournament doing nothing while john was playing so she became a tournament director so very quickly you guys to give you more context the person he's talking about carol jarecki she is an inter international arbiter she has been an arbiter at various world championship matches including the anon kasparov match i believe it was in 1995 at the world trade center and it was her son that my stepfather was teaching who they're talking about in this video Where's Carol's son? So then when he became youngest master, I mean, then I, you know, I mean, then I started getting calls all over the place and, and one thing led to another and I started, you know, coaching. And you also wrote a lot of books, right? Uh, was it at that point or that came later? That came later because so this was in the uh, late 70s, 80s, you know, I'm doing a lot of coaching. I started a lot of school programs. A lot of the scholastic programs in school started because of me, because I was able to convince a school in Manhattan called the Hunter College uh, Campus School to include chess in the curriculum. Okay. And that then led to gradually just becoming a part of... Um, who is the guy speaking? The guy speaking is Sagar Shah. He's an interviewer for uh, Chess Base India. He is talking to th this guy, my stepfather, who looks a little bit like Lyric, for those of you who are wondering. Um, so let's the keep going. The culture of the New York City scholastic scene. So I feel I was responsible for that to, you know, to, to a very large extent. But um, uh, that's, that's when it started. Yeah, I, I, I remember there's a book called best tips for oh, chess best, coaches best what is it best lessons coach. of a chess so coach that one i wrote in 93 and um i have to say you know i mean it's okay uh do you do you guys want me to watch the whole video through or do you want me to pause and answer questions throughout because i mean we have to i kind of have to decide what what do you guys want would you rather ask questions at the end or do i should i play it through and answer at the end or pause and answer questions in between what do you want Um, pause. Okay. A lot of people are saying pause. Okay. Then, then I'll just, I'll do the pause. Okay. So, so what I would say is the reason that we're talking about how it starts the programs is because in the seventies, in the, in the late seventies, I could be wrong on my dates, but in the late seventies, Hunter and Dalton, um, Hunter is, is technically public, although you have to test into it and Dalton, which is a private, private school. Um, basically they were the two first, uh, schools that had, that had um that had had chess programs and they were very very successful so what happened is is that led to sort of all the other schools trying to include chess at the elementary level and eventually incorporate it into either the curriculum or into after school and having um, all these programs so that is really what started it and that's what's led to all all the stuff that has happened now um in new york so it, it that was basically the origins dalton and hunter my stepfather was one of the coaches. The other coach was Savitar, um, Savitar Jovanovic. Uh, he was he was uh, also an immigrant from Yugoslavia who who came to the came to the U.S. Um, 
and uh and yeah so 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 both of them started their programs and because of that that led to is sort of built onto it like those schools were successful other schools saw it happening the benefits and it just built you know built on top of each other and that was really the foundation for what you have today with all the different chess programs throughout the throughout the tri-state area um Sevatari Ivanovich, yes, he, uh, I will read something by the CEO of Zillow after this, who was a student at Dalton. Um, so I'll read that afterwards. Look, as far as chess books go, I was very fortunate because it sold almost 30,000 copies. Wow, that's so, huge when you consider <laughs> chess books. But you know what was interesting about the book was that when I, so I had someone follow me around for a year and tape my lectures. And then he, you know, we picked out 10, or the better ones and you know and and we presented it that way and i so i said you know let's keep the format the question and answer format right so some i ask the question somebody gives me a wrong answer the wrong answer then gives me a chance to explain why it's wrong so you know it's a good teaching moment right right when i took this to the publisher a random house and the publisher said you know the editor said well it's too long <laughs> and all these wrong answers um, maybe we should take them out. I said, you don't get it, do you? <laughs> so in the end, of course, I won the battle. And uh, because Random House had just uh, taken over the McKay publishing, um, you know, McKay had just books, but they're right. terrible diagrams. So I didn't want this book coming out with that. So I convinced them. I convinced Random House to get the Linares font. And my book was the first one that they did with that font. Right. Because I wanted... Frankly, that's pretty random. I don't even know what Linares chess font is or what that has to do exactly. But, but whatever, <laughs> Linares font, I don't even know what that is. But, but okay, um, let's keep watching. Clear diagrams. So, but what a lot of people tell me even today is that um, it's very readable. Yeah. So I think uh, it made a difference. I yeah, you, know, you made a huge contribution to chess literature uh, in a way. Uh, tell us also about uh, Hikaru Nakamura, about uh, how, how did you start uh, interacting with him? This did, should were be you fun. the one who taught him chess? Or how, how was it? Well, so, so it's Hikaru's brother who was the chess player. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a national elementary school championships and his brother Oscar was playing in the kindergarten and uh, you know his mom was there with the two kids and I was single and somebody thought it would be a good idea to kind of you know introduce us and so forth and and so that's how it started and then I started dating his mom and Hikaru didn't play chess I mean he was he was a pain in the neck at that time <laughs> and, uh, and it was like you know I mean Oscar was a chess player and I remember when Oscar qualified to play for the U.S. in Minorca in the uh, World Under 10, which Hari won. Okay. So, you know, I, I remember that from 96, because right. Hari won the gold medal. And um, so I was there with Oscar. Hikaru didn't really play chess. So I told Carlin, anyway, bring him for the second week. You can have a vacation. And, and he came. And, you know, gradually, you know, he, he got interested. But I, I didn't want him at first to play chess because I thought it was unfair to have him measure up to his brother who was very good. Right. You know, I thought that was putting too much of a burden, so I tried to, but the more I pushed him away, the more interested he became. <laughs> <laughs> and we can see him right now, he's one of the best in the world, but did you instantly start to sense that he was good at chess? No, actually, to be honest, it's, for about the first year, I didn't really see anything. You know, and... Uh, and you know and Hikaru you know wasn't so happy when he lost and so forth and I told my wife maybe this is not a good idea you know um, and then one day he played in this tournament and I get this phone call from um, another chess teacher it's about uh, 2100 and um, and he said to me Sunil his son just beat me I said you're kidding right <laughs> and he said no 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 it was a really good game and take a look at the game you know it, there was no luck he played well and, came home, I looked at it, and it's almost as though, all of a sudden, it cl things click differently, he saw things differently, you know, and um, and he just took off like a rocket. Yeah. I mean, so, when you, if you look at his MSA, 
in you know if you go to U.S. Chess and you look at this chess history, right? What they call the member services area. Okay, chat. We're gonna be doing that later. Apparently, since he brought this up, I'll, I'll go to the website and see if I can pull it up from the old days. His MSA. You'll see that for the first year, his rating didn't even break a thousand. That's one year of playing. Right. Now he didn't play all that many tournaments. So there was a fair sampling of tournaments. And um, so there was nothing really for me to, you know. But I'll tell you, the one thing he always said was determination. He was totally, totally determined person. <laughs> Yeah. And and how did he become like the this right now we call him the bullet king or the blitz king such speed I mean is it a, is it something you're born with or you can ingrain it uh... You know it's amazing you know I I, I tell you um, and this is where training is so interesting because I don't believe that there is one method for everybody you know I was being criticized all the way you know, during Hikaru's upbringing as a chess player, that I'm letting him play too much blitz. Because he was playing blitz all the time. You know, but to a certain extent, that's how I learned also. Right? And and what I... And, and then when he became a master, and Hikaru broke the record for youngest master, he became master at like 10 years and two months. Um, and then I thought I'll accelerate his process, his progress. He still does play. He still does play too much chess. Yeah, I like how someone just also said, guy in the background is hungry. <laughs> Good one, you guys. You guys are funny. Uh, but yes, I, I still play too much blitz. Right, exactly. Let's keep watching. And I contacted a grandmaster friend of mine, saying, "Would you like to work with Hikaru?" You know, and he said, "Of course." And it lasted about three lessons. <laughs> really. <laughs> And I could see he was being a little, um, you know, he wasn't so thrilled. And okay, so I can t I don't know if he's going to talk about this, but I'll, I'll tell you who it was. So I, I took lessons with Grandmaster Ron Henley. He trained with former world champion Anatoly Karpov for a period of time. He also at that time was coaching. Um, he was also coaching, I believe, Irina Crush. I um, mean, he's part of this company called Smart Chess. Um, so I remember this very well. And there were, the, basically the reason that it did not work out well, I don't, he might talk about it. I don't think he will. But but um, the reason I bring it up, just to give context in case he doesn't. Um, and it was mainly because, like, the way that I played chess was so much different. And trying to, um, trying to like, you know, read a, read, a, read a book on somebody like Siegbert Teresch, the German chess player, philosopher, whatever you want to call him, um, was just not very stimulating, shall we say. And, um, and so, I like, I read, like, a few pages. I'm like, what is this? Like, let me throw this book out the window. Um, so let's keep watching. And then I said, so, so what's going on? He says, well, he says, you know, I really don't, shouldn't be playing Blitz because it's bad for my game. And, but, but, you know, what I realized was you can't ask somebody to put in countless hours of work if you mm -hmm. take away the aspect of the game that gives him enjoyment. Mm. True. Or pleasure. He loved it. It's like, chat. this would be like me telling XQC, like, dude, stop playing bullet. No more bullet, dude. No more bullet. No, no, no. That's what it'd be like. So I'm denying him this because I said, no, you know what? If you want to play blitz, play blitz. You know, and um, I guess. <laughs> and he just he kept learning from his blitz games yeah. just on yes. the go. Yeah, all the time. In fact, I remember, I think Gelfand once wrote an article saying, you know, Nakamura is one of a new breed of chess players. I, you know, he sort of got there not so much by studying the classics, but by, by virtue of playing hundreds and thousands of games. So basically, you guys, I'm like, I'm like a, <clears throat> I'm not the only one now, but I'm like a human version of, um, of like Alpha Zero or Leela. Basically, the way I learned was just playing Blitz over and over and over again. So it's like it's it is very much like the AI kind of kind of approach. Um, so it is it is like that. But of course, as a human, I'm still I'm still total total dog shit. So whatever. <laughs> well, actually, two examples come to my mind. One is of Vishy Anand. When he was young, he used to play very quickly. People yeah. used to tell him slow down. But actually, when he slowed down, his uh, results used yeah. to suffer. Yes, and I, I, I mm -hmm. think there's something to that. I, I think that each person has his own rhythm. And I think you have to be true to your rhythm. And, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that true. is. And, and play accordingly. And so I think maybe one of the best things I did, you know, was not stopping Hikaru playing that. Uh. You know, and I'm not saying that that 
that path is the right one for everybody, you know, and may not be. But but he was processing every time he played a game. He was processing and learning from that. So. Seeing Hikaru grow up from being a very young kid. Do you feel that uh, that he has it in him to become the ultimate world champion or what's your take on this? You know, this is a very interesting question because obviously everybody would love to be world champion. Yeah, that there's no question about that. But you know, the system is such that you have to be very fortunate. If you go through history, you can look at the number of great players who never became world champion. You know, and I told Ricardo recently, I said, look, you know, I know you would still like to do it, but you're not going to make the candidates this time. You know, so that means you have to wait for the next cycle. It may happen, it may not. But the point is that if you just look at what you have achieved, you have nothing to prove. You know, you've done, you know, so much in chess. And, you know, you should be content with that. And if it happens that, you know, then so much the better. But, you know, don't pin all your hopes on that. Right. Okay, I have one final question yeah. about Hikaru. It is like we had this test recently where I gave games of Anand, yeah, to, to, for the people to solve. I gave yeah. it to Magnus and uh, he, he got the answers immediately. Yeah, like if I gave him a position, he would say, this is Anand versus... This is going to be an interesting response. This is Anand versus so and so. So he was good. When I gave it to Hikaru, he was more like, I have never seen this game. Yeah, this looks like an old game, but I know the opening. So basically, he was not brought up on classics. Yeah, this is uh, something which, uh, ha yeah. I mean, people say classics are very important. Yeah, and, and, and you know something, we live in a different age. You know, yeah, the classics are important, but I mean, you know, <laughs> which reminds me once, because this grandmaster friend of mine who I had sent Hikaru to for additional training had wanted Hikaru to study X number of Steinitz games, X number of Morphy games, X number of Steinitz games and yeah. so, And Hikaru tells me, he says that I look at the Sparov games online, I look at Anand games online, why do I have to study dead people? <laughs> Well, that was that's his approach, yes, and he, he stayed true to his approach, and he's reached all the way to 2800. So, why I think the lesson here is that there is more than one way to the top, right? You know, and what is important for a trainer is to figure out what motivates the player, mm -hmm. and then work, you know, from that perspective. But so, to not to impose a system on the player but let the player's interest dictate the kind of work that you do. Sure. Wonderful. That's great advice. Uh, what's your future plans now? What are you doing these days and uh, are you still oh, a chess trainer or how does it work? Uh, yeah, I'm still working. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I, I, have, I created my own foundation back in 1990. I'm the executive director of the National Scholastic Chess Foundation. And, you know, our mission is to, to try and bring chess into schools, into the curriculum. You know, which is why I wrote my history book, for example, so to show points of intersection between regular, regular academic subjects and, um, and chess, you see. And I think we need to do more of that. So I, I, I do that. I probably will keep doing that. I don't really see myself, you know, retiring. Um, the question is, should I start playing again? <laughs> okay. And Ricardo says, Dad, forget it. You're too old. <laughs> you know, there is no way. <laughs> but you but have you a, now you have a strong trainer in Ikaru if he... <laughs> he's going to help me. <laughs> you know? But in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, I could win the Sri Lanka National Championship again. You know, why not? I mean, uh, I'm not quite 70. I'm almost there. But, you know, so why not? So I, I would like to. Um, whether, you know, uh, you know, my health holds up, I don't know, you know, but, but yeah, so a bit of, a bit of playing, a bit yeah. more playing perhaps, definitely teaching, but in particular though, trying to, you know, to advocate for chess as being part of the curriculum. Right. And what about Sri Lanka? Sri Lankan chess, it's not picked up as much as, let's say, India or some other countries. What, what's going on there? Are you in touch with it? 
very much. I go back at least once a year, sometimes twice. My mom is still alive, so I go back to see her, you know, and I'm in very close touch with Lakshman and the Federation, you know, and, and I, I help train. I've coached the Olympiad team a few times. Um, and, and so forth. You know, we have very talented players. Yes. Very talented players. But they get to a certain point <laughs> and then they have... <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys keep talking about the guy in the background who, who just literally has been eating non-stop for the last 20 minutes. I mean, it's just like, oh my God, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I have to pause for a second or else I'm going to break out laughing. Uh, <laughs> never ending sandwich. <laughs> okay. Um, my, yeah, okay. <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> Stuff mm. because the parents make them stop, you know. So, no, you can't play anymore. You got to do your O levels, you got to do your A levels, and then, well, how are you going to make a living? So, what's the point of playing chess? So, you know, you have in the scholastic ranks there is a strong chess movement, mm. but it stops dead, right? When they reach a certain age, mm -hmm. and I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, maybe you, you would uh, find some way out of that as well. But this was a really enlightening talk. It was wonderful speaking to you. Thank you for sharing so many uh, of your experiences and also pearls of wisdom. I mean, I'm sure a lot of parents will find it useful Thank as well as much. as well as trainers. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so, okay. So I just thought I would show that to you guys. So there are a couple things I would add. Uh, one, the overarching factor, which I think is very, very important to be very specific, um, is that as you see what he says? Um, he was the, the 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 video man was was uh, he was he was tired of the uh, of the sandwich guy. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So so what I was gonna say specifically about that, I, I could try to get him on stream. That wouldn't be too hard. Um, but what I would say very specifically is like the method that one size fits all is a huge issue, not just in chess, but in the actual public education system these days. Because what you have nowadays is you're, you have um, a system where we're trying to force kids to take tests. It's all about passing tests and that's the only thing that matters. And so what you're doing is you're really like hurting a lot of, lot of children in the, in the public school system because not everyone learns things the same way. So even though this is from a chess perspective, you can take it and also put it in, in the context of, of our public education system and the issues that we do have right now. Um, so, so yeah, I definitely could try to get him on the stream. Um, but I hope you guys did enjoy that. Um, I mean, there's a lot more that could be said, obviously, about my stepfather. Um, he's, of course, been... Uh, He's, um, I mean, he's been teaching at Hunter for so many years. Like I said, he started, he started the program at, at, at Hunter. I believe it was 1978, I think it was, but it was many, many years ago. 